Well, uh, my name's James Trevette. Uh, for, looks like we might have some new people here. And uh, tonight I'm continuing on with a series called For the Love of God, which is the Gospel of the Kingdom. And uh, I think each week I say, because we do have new people from time to time, that the Gospel of the Kingdom is a little different than the Gospel of Salvation. Now, uh, last week, as a matter of fact, we talked about the gospel of salvation. But that's not where we end here. The gospel of the kingdom doesn't end with salvation. It really starts with salvation. And it's about your place in God's calling and purpose. Because God is doing something around it. it it's become so evident that God has a, uh, an activity going on in this world right now, and certainly in our nation and in the church. He's got a plan. And I believe it's, a, uh, it's an excellent plan. I know things don't look too good at the time. Maybe uh, the crucifixion didn't look like a good idea at the time. And Peter didn't think it was a great idea. But I believe God has the perfect plan. And even though it may not look perfect to us, it's there to bring about his will upon the earth. You say, well, Lord, why don't you just come down here and fix this thing? And of course, what's the answer? He plans on it. He will. But we've got to be ready to receive him. It's got to be in the fullness of time and in the right way. So I believe he's working a plan, and I believe he's got a purpose for all of us. So this Gospel of the Kingdom series is to show you your place in the kingdom. And tonight, we're actually all the way up to part 10. And uh, the title of this one is To Be Loved. And in this lesson, the key scripture is Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what we're going to talk about is what does God really want from us? And by the way, that one's sort of subtle, but there's a hint here, the title of this. Everybody seems to think God wants obedience, but he's got all sorts of angels for obedience. God wants to be loved. And if we don't understand that, it's very hard for us to understand his word in the gospel and his purposes for why he does what he does. So what does produce love? What destroys love? And can you command love? Now that sounds a little ridiculous, but it's not. People try it all the time. You will love me, right? God tried it. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Now that's right out of the law. So in notice it says, and you shall. Anybody who knows contracts knows that when you see a shall, it means it's a requirement. So can you see why we might have trouble meeting the law? Just from this one thing. Because it's a command to love him. But love doesn't work from a command, does it? And by the way, it doesn't say love the Lord your God with balance, does it? No, it says all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. So that's the requirement here. But did it work? When God gave this command, did it cause Israel to love him? No, no because you cannot command love. So we're going to be looking at love and what produces it. So I've got a little video here, F6 on this. And uh, this is a Hollywood version. And by the way, this is a clip from Bruce Almighty. And in Bruce Almighty... Uh, James Carey is playing this Bruce who challenged God and said, God, you're just not doing a very good uh, job with all this stuff here. And so Morgan Freeman is playing God. And he says, hey, if you think you can do better, I'll let you try. So he gave Jim Carey, Bruce, all these powers. So the problem is, though, Jim Carey is having problems with his marriage. But, of course, he can fix that, right, because he's got all power. So let's see. Have you completely lost your mind? What, are you drunk? Yeah, I'm drunk. Drunk with power. <sighs> Love me. Love me. Love me. Love me! I did. Yeah, I know. Free will. She'll take me back. 
She'll take me back, right? Would you take me back? How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? <laughs> Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one, you let me know. See the problem here? You can have all power, you can have all knowledge, you can have all wisdom. But apparently it just doesn't work in a relationship. As a matter of fact, having all those things doesn't really seem to help in the relationship, in case you've noticed. Wouldn't you love to be married to someone who was always right, who had all power and all this? It, it doesn't always work as well as you think it might. So we're going to look at the scripture and see what the scripture says, because Hollywood had the right question. But the problem is Hollywood doesn't have the right answer. But God does. So let's look at it in Galatians 5, 18, 19, and 22. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. There's your fall line up on the TV network, right? <laughs> Hostility, strife, jealousy, anger, disputes, dissensions. Does that sound like stuff that happens in a relationship? So if you're yielding to the flesh for reasons of lust or fear, you're going to start developing these characteristics. But it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And of course, that's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of those things are of the Spirit. So what he's saying is that there's a choice here that you need to make. And he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So let's look at that from our diagram, which we've been uh, developing through this series. And in this diagram, there's our little guy made up of spirit, soul, and body, right? But you notice that there's two paths to God here. And that's obviously this person is saved because if they're not saved, they don't have this upper path, do they? Because they have a dead spirit. But if you're saved, you now have this righteous spirit within you. And you can relate to God two ways. One through the tree of life, the new covenant. And it's an identity-based relationship through Jesus Christ with God. So God looks at you as, a, as family. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And you can operate, if you're operating in the spirit and living by the spirit, you have a personal family relationship with God himself. However, if you choose to operate in the flesh, then you're putting yourself under the law the same way that you were before you were saved. And under that law, you're being judged by how well you perform under the law. Knowing good from evil, you have the law. So if you do well, you get blessed. If you do poorly, then you, you don't get so blessed. So it's performance-based, meaning that you earn your acceptance by what you do. So these are the two trees of relationship all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Now, unfortunately, many of us might have been raised at times under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You may, uh, your acceptance may have been based upon your performance rather than who you are. And if that's the case, that produces the deeds of the flesh. And so we need to look at these two because I believe this is the key. Because remember what it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So the key is to be yielded to the Spirit because you are down here in the soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, and you have a choice. Your choice is that you can yield to the spirit or you can yield to the flesh. Now the flesh, of course, has is, is got all sorts of things pulling you that direction. You, you have lust, you have pride, and you have fear that's going to pull you right down into that. But, of course, when you operate under that, you're now operating in a performance-based relationship. And performance-based relationships don't work well. Why? Because where is love? See, love is of the Spirit. And if you make the choices, you're going to operate and produce one of two things. If you operate in the flesh, you're going to produce the deeds of the flesh. But if you operate in the Spirit, you're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is the fruit of God. 
you're going to be attached to him. So if you operate in the spirit, you're going to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. All these things are of the spirit and of God. But if you yield to the flesh, then you're going to start moving into fear and producing control and anger, lust, jealousy, strife. So can you see what the problem is in our relationships? That if you move toward having your own self-righteousness, then you're moving toward the flesh. And when you do, you then begin control and anger and strife and jealousy and all sorts of things. But when you move toward the Spirit and yield yourself to Him, you're no longer worried about yourself. See, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they probably didn't have a set of laws that they, I don't think they had garden etiquette, you know, and all those things with the list of rules, you should, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. No, I don't think that's the way they did it because there was love. Remember, they were naked and unashamed. It was Adam and Eve and God all in the garden together in relationship, and they didn't need a lot of law. But as we know, whenever things start going south in a relationship, the love starts to leave, what's the next thing that shows up? The lawyers, right? The law. So th this is the key. If you can understand this, this is the key to producing love. John said it this way in 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So now you say, well, does that mean unsaved people can't love? Well, I think there is a certain amount of love because I do believe that God has embedded within us a conscience and certain love, like love for your children and things like that. But to build a love in an independent relationship like that, I believe the spirit is the key. Otherwise, you begin to focus on yourself, and when you do, you're going to move into the flesh. You're going to get into performance. You're going to get into fear. You're going to get into lust, and all those things start to happen. Matthew 24, he's talking about in the last days. And he says, in the last days, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So what's going to be happening? Well, I believe what's happening is that all the things that are out there on the TVs and all of this and the things that are producing all the jealousy, the strife, and all these things that we're watching on TV are moving you toward the flesh. And the more you move toward the flesh, the more you move away from love in the spirit. So we don't realize it because it's, it seems like a gradual way our society has moved away from the love of the spirit and has now come into the factions. Jealousy, strife, anger, and control. So that's what I believe when it says the love will grow cold. It's because we've moved away from the spirit where love lives. So let's look at a story to try to understand in the Bible. Now, whenever you see a couple of people in the Bible, the first thing that I usually think of is contrast. Because when God has two of something, he's usually uh, trying to say, let me compare these two things. Now, as you know, I believe that the two trees are all the way through the Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And in those two trees, you'll find different dimensions of things. And I believe that it's represented here with two people, Martha and Mary. Now, as they were traveling along, he, G Jesus, entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's words seated at his feet. So if these two represent the two trees, let's just look and see if that's a possibility. First of all, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's about building self-righteousness. It's about law. It's about religion. And it's a performance-based and a works-based relationship, right? That's the way that tree works. It's a tree of relationship. And it produces the deeds of the flesh. The other is the tree of life. And it's not about your righteousness. It's God's righteousness. You get it imputed to you because he's your family. You're married to the king of righteousness. So it's God's righteousness. And you operate in grace and relationship. And your acceptance isn't based upon your performance. It's based upon your identity. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But it produces the fruit of love. So let's look at these two and see if, they can, if they're modeling these two relationships. So let's go back to the story here. I'll start in 39. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's words seated at his feet. So the two of them were sisters, right? 
They came from the, the same parents. They lived in the same home. We were raised the same way. But there's a difference between the two. So notice, let's look at Martha. Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care? Let me just stop right there. When you hear those words come out of somebody's mouth, what's coming? When you hear, do you not care, what do you think is about to happen? Uh, all sorts of things, right? Mainly a manipulation. It's an attempt to manipulate you. Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the serving alone? You, Jesus, tell her to help me. Now, the reason this is important is to look at these two models because these are also two models of prayer, in case you haven't figured that out. That you can pray off one tree, you can pray on the others. I've been in a lot of the different prayer groups. Not in this one, this haven't seen this, but I've seen it before where they look just like this. Lord, don't you care that we're suffering? Tell those people to do this and this and this and this. So, but the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary, really only one. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So what do you think the one thing that is the important thing? Could it be love? The relationship and the love? So can you see the difference between the two? So if we go back and we look at our little model here, which do you think is which? I know this is really tough, right? Um, can you see where Martha is working this performance to try to earn her acceptance? She's focused on herself, and she's using the law. Say, I'm doing this. Why don't you tell her to help me? But Mary is operating in a relationship of grace and identity. So there's a difference between these two, even though they're raised in the same household and are sisters. So we want to find out what happened to Mary that brought her to this revelation. Because this is a picture of the love, the fruit of love. So to do this, we're going to go back to John 11 and start there. It's also it was the same Martha and Mary. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we're familiar with the raising of Lazarus, but this is Martha and Mary, again, and her brother Lazarus. But it tells us something about Mary that it, apparently it had already happened at this point. It was the Mary who had anointed the Lord with oil. And so we're going to look and say, well, where is that in the Bible? Now, I don't have a lot of time tonight, but I did throw in for extra credit, if you want to, <laughs> to read John 11, the story of Lazarus, and look at how Martha and Mary both approached Jesus. <clears throat> you notice that Martha went out and tried to push her will about what she wanted to get from Jesus. And when she didn't seem to get the results she wanted, she went and manipulated Mary to try to get it. And it's interesting that both women said exactly the same words to Jesus. However, Martha tried to move Jesus' hand, but Mary ended up moving his heart. So while she was, Mary, Martha was trying to say, I want you to do this, Mary was saying, thank you, you're here. This terrible thing has happened and left room for Jesus to come in. So it's, once again, I think it's a good model for prayer if you want to take a look at the stories. But let's go back and find out the story of Mary. Let's go to Luke 7, 37 through 48. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And by the way, do you think she was a sinner? I think she probably was. And back then, when you was a woman was a sinner, what do you think she probably was? Yeah, a prostitute, a harlot, right? And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Well, if she was a harlot, 
wouldn't that be sort of the tools of the trade? She probably had the good stuff. But she's taking literally the tool of her trade and bringing it. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this, and what sort of woman this person is who's touching him and that she is a sinner. Isn't it interesting? He says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this woman was. He, but he said it just to himself, right? So what do you think happens here? And Jesus answered. <laughs> Understand? He didn't even say it out loud. So trust me, Jesus knew not only who she was, but he knew exactly what the guy was thinking. So he answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. And he said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which one of them will love him more? There it is. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. So what's just happened here? First of all, remember what the law was? What was it? Love the Lord your God. So which one of these two fulfilled that commandment? The Pharisees said, hey, we're righteous, we've done it. And Jesus said, well, let's look at that. You wanted to fulfill the law, did you? And he compared the two. And he says, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Because remember the Pharisees were those who didn't need to be forgiven much because they were righteous, remember? They had used the law to declare themselves righteous and they worked hard at it, but they were very obedient. But you see, obedience isn't the key to love. He has angels that could be obedient, but yet we seem to think that that's the whole thing is about disobedience. But in your relationship, is it disobedience? Is that really the issue? No, I don't think so. If, if a man's going to marry a woman, I don't think obedience is the first thing he's going to look at. If you marry someone, you want to marry someone that you love. But what else is important? That they obey you? That they love you? So how do you produce love? And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Luke 10 Let's go back there. But the Lord answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are really necessary, really only one. And Mary has chosen the good part, and it shall not be taken from her. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. So, to be loved. Fruit of the Spirit's love. So what does God really want from us? He wants what you'd want in any relationship, in any family. He wants to be loved. What produces love? Mercy and forgiveness. What destroys love? Control, manipulation, judgment, kills love. You may get what you think you want, but you'll not get, it will destroy love if you do it. Can you command love? Well, God tried it, and if God didn't do it, more than likely, 
you're not going to be able to either. Well, let's see. Uh, got one more little clip here. And this I put together as from clips from the movie Jesus of Nazareth. So I sort of assembled them all together to show the story of Mary. So we're going to end with that. Let's see if I can play this. You ready? Mind your mother's business. Crazy. And your sisters! What's going on? Ah! Ask those pigs over there! Those big brave sons of yours! Name go on. There's no peace in this neighborhood since you came here. Noise and filth. The curse of God is on you. So what do you think? Is the curse of God upon her? Yes. Yeah, it is. At this point, she's under the law, and she's realizing, oh, my gosh, the curse of God is upon me. So let's see what happens. <laughs> Don't worry, Mary. They're only boys' games. Ah, <coughs> boys, they would only burn my house down. The fathers. They're all against me. <laughs> Not all, Mary. <laughs> There's a friend of yours in town today. I have no friends. Oh, yes, you have. Jesus, the prophet. Friend of our God, forgiver of sins. Hmm? Hey, according to him, the sins of the flesh are nothing compared to the sins of the soul. Hey. A man will always forgive a man. A woman's sin. <laughs> That's another story. For most people, but not for him. I've never seen anybody like him. Have you seen him often? If you go around on business like me, you can't help seeing him. Turn a corner, cross a square, go into a cavern. There he is. Come on. It's been like that for about a year. You sure you haven't come across him? Oh, I sleep during the daytime, don't I? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. Well, there are big crowds following him everywhere. Sometimes so big he has to sleep in the field. And he thinks nothing of eating and drinking with thieves and whores. Any scum of the earth is good enough for him, eh? One of his disciples, as they call themselves, was a, was a tax collector, this thieving swine. But this Jesus, well, he says, it's not the righteous that need him, it's the sinners. So you see? Yeah, I've got a friend. Mm -hmm. uh. What about next week? Oh. some point comes to this. Let's follow the story on. Joseph of Arimathea, one of the leading Pharisees in Jerusalem. Which of you, for all his worrying, can add one day to his life, one inch to his stature? 
So don't concern yourself so much with the means of life. What you shall eat and drink, or with your bodies, and how they should be clothed. Life is more than clothing. Consider the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, but our Heavenly Father feeds them. Will he not all the more feed you? Are you not worth more than they? Consider the lilies of the field. They do not spin. They do not weave. But not even Solomon in all his glory was so arrayed as one of these. <laughs> Extraordinary. But isn't that taking it too far? Huh? Well, surely our religion isn't opposed to honest, hard work. So, can you see it? Can you see the side setting up here and the contrast? Much of what he says has been said by the prophets, but not like this. I agree with you. But we can't be sure until we meet with him face to face. Why not invite him to eat with us? Hmm. Would he come? I'm sure he would. Such a man must be willing to discuss his ideas with people who are open-minded. <laughs> so, can you see it coming? away. We've got nothing to give them to eat. They should go to the villages where they can find food. There's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. Oh, there are thousands of them. We cannot feed them. Can we? Can we feed them? He said, you give them something to eat. That's us. So let's see what he does to enable his disciples. Is there any food left? This is all we have. Five barley loaves and two fish. Put the loaves and the fish in the baskets and give them to the people.
John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said he was possessed by devils. Here I am, drinking and eating freely with you. No doubt you'll say I'm a glutton and a drinker. Friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. <laughs> oh, Rabbi, you do us an injustice. We respect your achievements, and we understand their importance. But to what extent are you prepared to accept our laws? We hear that you heal the sick on the Sabbath. Do you want our people not to rest on the Sabbath? You see the situation? Are you willing to accept our laws? You see, they built a set of laws even outside of the Bible. They had their own fence laws. And he says, hey, are you going to obey our laws? And he, you can see, the, of course, the effect. I think that's translated loosely as oy vey. If one of you had a sheep and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath day, wouldn't you go and get it out? But God made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. Oh, oh, we understand that. We understand what you're trying to say. But is it not confusing to the other people? We live by the law. If we accept the law to be ruled by exceptions, then we are lost. Today, if it hadn't been for the severity that we learned from Moses, we would not have our laws. We would not even have, we'd not even be a people any longer. But it is the, the excessive tolerance, the lack of rigidity in your teaching that has made us feel that this is a real danger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I believe if you haven't heard that, probably not preaching the real gospel because you remember as Paul preached the real gospel the word came well you know should we sin the grace abounds more because there is a gospel here and I believe that they're looking at it and trying to understand it for gold gives me security it's a guide to my whole way of life a measure for judging this man is right this man is wrong and you should not judge. But you, as a son of Israel, know that we were chosen by God from all mankind to be the holy nation. And for this, he gave us our law, the Torah, which is the law of life. And we have to separate ourselves from the sinners and be pure and just. But who is just in the eyes of the Lord? What is the heart of the law? Hear, O Israel, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. This is the greatest commandment. You said well. You are not far from the kingdom of God, Joseph of Arimathea. But there is another commandment. No less great. You must love your neighbor as yourself. But who is my neighbor? No! 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 Stop her! No! You can't come in! This is no place for the likes of you! What's the matter? Oh, is this, is this, see that woman? Yes, yes, yes. That horse. What is she doing? She's defiling him. This is no place for you, woman. Come, leave quickly. Simon, sit down. But Rabbi, you know what kind of a woman this is. Simon, please. Simon, when I came into your house, you didn't pour water over my feet, or kiss me in greeting, or anoint my head with oil. She has washed my feet with her tears. 
and dried them with her hair and anointed them. <laughs> Daughter, your sins, <sighs> and I know they are many, are forgiven you because of the greatness of your love. Oh, yes. Yes. Only God can forgive sins, no man. Yes. 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 Daughter. Take this ointment. And keep it for my burial. Go in peace. To be loved, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the sacrifices that you made for us. And Lord, we, we thank you that we can be free from this bondage of sin. And Lord, we thank you for the perfect plan. And whatever we have to go through and whatever we have to do, Lord, we, we want to receive this that you are doing in our life. Let it have its perfect work, Lord, that your love may be birthed in us, that we may, that we may love you and we may love each other. I thank you for this time together, Lord, and I ask you just to free us up, Lord. Show us the truth. The flesh cannot win out, but, but Lord, that we will yield unto your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. <laughs>